God's word is good. I'm still so happy to be in Luke. And I've actually went back and looked again. We're going to touch on some spots in the past that um, I can study it for the rest of my life. I'm sorry. It is such a wonderful book. There is nothing like God's Word. And Luke is a substantial, important part of it. Because it's what we know of God's plan. And we are on the way to the cross. This is Jesus' final steps to, the, to his execution. And we've met one along the way that was grabbed out of the crowd and, and shoved and forced into helping Jesus carry the cross to Skull Hill, to his death. But there's more people on the way of the cross. And before we get into this, I want to make sure we understand when John had said in his gospel, he said, he came unto his own, he came unto that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. We all understand that. He came to the nation of Israel, his own people, and yet they did not receive him. And he was the much-awaited Messiah, they waited millenniums, generation after generation of people had this hope of the coming Messiah. And he finally came, and in spite of that fact, in spite of the fact he taught as no man ever taught with such authority that he had, speaking divine truth, he demonstrated compassion, he offered salvation and entrance into the kingdom and he just demonstrated divine power by casting out demons, curing diseases, and even raising the dead. And even having control over nature itself. But the nation rejected him. And now their Messiah is being led to Skull Hill. And we have this whole multitude of people. But out of all these thousands of people, I really want you to think about this. Multitudes. Remember in the past, people were stepping over each other. We're, we're talking about tens of thousands of people following Jesus. And the multitudes are in Jerusalem on this day. There's around 2 million people in the city at this time of Passover. And yet we know on this final journey of only two people that come to the Lord, actually three. One was Simon of Serene, we talked about last night, or last week. Um, the man from North Africa who traveled in, he became a believer. So much so he went back to his home, started a church where this church grew and they're sending out evangelists, missionaries to the world that would reach to places in Asia Minor where Paul was, and Paul would be sent out. I mean, the effects are amazing here from one person. And then secondly, we'll meet the thief. There's two thieves, criminals. They're, they're more than thieves. They are actually insurrectionists. We all know that word now, right? It, uh, it, they, were, they were revolting against Rome and had acts of sedition and they were being justly punished for their crimes. But one of them would turn and see Jesus for who he truly was. And then thirdly, an unnamed Roman centurion who confesses this was surely the Son of God. But at this point, it's the few. Uh, uh, this, is, this, this was actually prophesied by Christ way back in the beginning when we started. In his ministry, when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, he gave these words, that there is a broad road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. 
that small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Right? And so, I know I've drawn this picture before, but this applies. Here's your wide, wide road, and it leads to destruction. Cliff. He's actually talking about hell, a separation from God. And this is, there's no two-way traffic here, even though I put that, that's a white line, not yellow lines. It's all one direction. And this is humanity's default position that we're all headed there. And, it, and as we've talked in the past, the moral all the way to the immoral Um, and the amoral who just don't care, okay? But moral people who think they're good as well as people that are bad in our eyes in the world that are not moral, they're all headed in the same direction. That's talking about we all have sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God, and we're born into this world as sinners heading toward judgment. And this road is wide. And Jesus is saying, the crowds are moving in that direction. But he's saying, look, there's an exit ramp off of here. <laughs> there's an exit off this interstate. And he's saying, it's a gate. This small little gate, and only a few will see it. But it leads to life. And it's a narrow road. And of course, he's talking about himself because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we see this actually happening here where there's this large crowd leading him out to his death and only a few will have that faith of saying, I know who you are. I know you, Jesus. You are the Messiah. You are the Savior. And this has to happen. In my prayer, I talked about it's how you view the cross. Is it a tragedy or is it a victory? I mean, there's two views there. For the narrow road, you see it as victory. With the rest of the world, you see it as a tragedy, as foolishness, as a joke. And so we have this whole crowd now following Jesus. And actually they represent the nation of Israel rejecting Him. And we have this curious, fickle crowd who are really at the bottom of it all are disappointed. Okay? They've been following Jesus and through the time and they've said, they were amazed by what Jesus said or what he did. Amazed. They were all tickled, okay? Because this is the reality show of their time, of watching this man perform miracles, and yet the religious leaders reject him. They're trying to figure it all out. They're thinking he's Messiah, but he's going to die. So they're confused. And so I'm thinking about this whole procession moving forward with Jesus. The Roman soldiers are leading him. And I'm thinking, where are the disciples? Right? Where are the people that loved Christ, that walked with him? Where are they? Well, when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. We learned that already. They're, in, they're hiding. They're, in, they're fearful for their life. They are confused. They think their hopes and dreams are all smashed. So they're gone. Andrew, Peter, Paul, James, John, Nathaniel, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, Jude, Thaddeus, all the disciples, they're all scattered and gone. And Jesus is here walking the road alone. 
because this is his mission. So, Luke 23, as we continue. Verse 26, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Serene, who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if the people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? And two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. Okay, that's he gives us a parable here and also some verses, or actually Old Testament verses. He quotes, and this is not... This is not something you would find in a card written to someone, (laughs) right? I think of all the sayings of Jesus, all the pithy little things that people will write sometimes. And and the things that Jesus say are very, very important. When he says, fear not, for I am with you, he means it. But this one is kind of overlooked because it doesn't fit our Christian mindset, right? It's kind of like when Jesus said, when you see the vultures gathering, there you will find me. He's talking about coming judgment in the future. He's he's laying down truth, a truth bomb here. And it's very important because it has to deal with the rejection of him. The, The nations saying, we do not want you as Messiah. And so we're introduced here to this crowd, and within this crowd following him is, are these people called women, called daughters of Jerusalem, that are following. And they're following, and they're wailing, and crying. And we have to ask, who, who are these women? Is it Mary, his mother? Is it Mary Magdalene? The women who were near and dear to him. I mean, there's a close group. Uh, Mary's sister would later on, we'll find out that they do show up at the cross later on. They have all ran in fear. But at the kind of in during the crucifixion, we'll find that Mary, her sister, Mary Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene all come to see Jesus from a distance along with the Apostle John. So one disciple comes back to see what happens. And that's where Jesus says, John, this is now your mother. He's, he's saying, take care of her. Um, but here we have women following him and crying. And we have to ask, who are these women? Well, they are a group of professional mourners. This was part of the Jewish tradition that at a funeral, they wanted to make sure there were people there who would mourn the loss of a life. And especially in this situation, at the hands of the Romans. So we have a group of women who are paid to do this. It is their duty. And... I'm not saying it's, it's not sincere. I mean, they are crying. They're following Jesus. They have pity on him because he's going to his death. 
And we were introduced to some of these mourners back in Luke chapter 8 when... Uh, turn back with me. I, 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 I don't, I don't want to summarize this because it, it's wonderful to read this. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. Wait, no, that's not right. Chapter 9. <laughs> There's no 40 in 8. <clears throat> Actually, it's verse 18. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. I mean, Matthew. I was going to say, I, I, I know I read this right. Okay, Luke 8. Yeah, verse 40. Luke 8. Luke 8, verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed, welcomed him. Then they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, a synagogue leader, okay? This is a religious person. So there are some that come to Christ. Here's one that came to him. Or is it come to him? He, well, yeah, he, did. he came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. Because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. So he's out there seeking Jesus, thinking maybe, well, more than that, that Jesus has healed people. Can he do this with his daughter? And he's trusting Jesus to do it. Now, of course, a woman comes and there, there's another part there where she comes up and touches his hem, hem of, his, of Jesus' robe and is healed. Um, but skip down to verse 49. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and they said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Leave him alone. She's dead. He can't heal her now. She's beyond his power. But it says, when he arrived at the house of Jairus, Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Okay, these are professional mourners that are there, along with family and other people. Okay. But Jesus says, said to them, Stop wailing. She is not dead but asleep. You're, 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 there's no reason to cry here whatsoever and do this, to think this way. And in verse 53 it says, They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. And her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. So here's, here's a group of those mourners. And he told them, stop mourning. You don't understand what's going on here. She's not dead. She's asleep. So we have this same thing happening now as Jesus is heading out to the cross. He is bruised. Not, to make sure we have this picture in our mind, He is bruised, beaten, um, scarred, lacerated, just a mess of a man. And these women are following Him and I'm sure their heart is crying out for Him. I have no doubts about that at all. And they're, they're sympathizing with him of saying, you poor, poor soul having to take all this abuse. Now Jesus' response to them, back in Luke 23, Just a quick note. I, I, nowhere in any of the Gospels is there any record 
record of a woman who is hostile toward Jesus. Have you ever noticed that before? Nowhere. <laughs> That's right, because women are the best, right? No, it, it, it is amazing because Jesus had something that they saw as the true man. And of course, everybody, like the religious peoples, were envious of him and his power. And yet there's nowhere. I, I tried to go through and thinking about the different women. The, I laugh because I think of Jesus at his first miracle in Cana at the wedding with his mother and how that relationship between Jesus and his mother where they run out of wine at the, at the feast and his mother comes to Jesus and says, Look, they're, they're, they're out of wine. Do something. Okay? I know who you are. Do something. And Jesus responds by saying, Woman, why do you involve me? This is the beginning of him starting to kind of separate himself from her, which he does further on. But here he says, What do you want with me? Why are you involving me? My time has not come yet. This is not my time. But then Mary turns around and goes to the servants and says, Listen to him. He's going to tell you what to do. Listen to him. She knows. This is a mother perfectly, right? And of course, Jesus says, Okay, go get the vats of water and bring them forth and... He turns the water into wine. But I, I just love that picture of Mary with him, and she, yet she's still trying to push Jesus into this. Um, and I think of Mary and Martha as well. And Martha, the one who says, Jesus comes to their house, and Mary's worshiping at Jesus' feet, understanding who he is. She, uh, she's a believer. And Martha, not so much. She's busy preparing the food and, and, and she's mad at her sister for not helping, which we all can understand that too. But she goes to Jesus and says, Make, do something about this. Kind of pushing Jesus into doing that. And, and then later on when Lazarus is dying, they send a message to Jesus that... He's dying, he's sick. And Jesus takes his time at least three days because according to Jewish tradition, the spirit of the body, which is not true, but Jewish tradition was it leaves on the fourth day. So Jesus waits that out to make sure he's completely yeah. dead. And he dies in the meantime. Mary and Martha are upset. And when Jesus finally comes... Martha comes out and says to him, why didn't you hurry up? You could, have, you could have stopped this. And she's kind of resentful toward Jesus at this time. And Mary doesn't even come. She's at home, it said. She doesn't even want to come out to Christ at that time. I mean, that's the only interactions I see other than women are coming to him wanting to be healed and responding to him. And yet, no one is hostile to him. No women. There's no Jezebel from the Old Testament who seeks the prophets and kills them. So, anyway, I went down that rabbit trail. But anyway, Jesus hearing these weeping and wailing mourners, he doesn't turn around and say, Thank you for your compassion and your sympathy and your care and your concern. He says the opposite of that. Jesus turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. This is a command. Stop it. Do not feel sorry. Have pity on me. 
do not think I'm a victim. Because in no way is Jesus a victim through any of this. This is his mission. This is on purpose. This is God's plan. And the words daughters of Jerusalem that was used all throughout the New Old Testament uh, when words were being spoken about the nation, um, it was either daughters of Jerusalem, daughters of Zion, uh, speaking of the women who were a part of that community. Um, but really, it's a message to the whole nation. This is a message to the whole nation as well. Stop weeping. weeping. And actually, it's taken from Micah 4.8, Zephaniah 3.14, the daughters of Zion. that they are a part of Israel. And Jesus says, look, if you're going to weep, weep for yourselves and for your children. Weep, weep for the real victims here. You need to weep tears of sorrow, remorse, and repentance. Realize what you are doing. You are killing the author of life. You have rejected me. Israel has rejected me. And Jesus has wept for Israel. As he came into Jerusalem, he cried because he knows what's coming. Because of his rejection, the nation of Israel, their house would become desolate. That's what he said. There's going to be, he even told them in... Luke 21, right before, a couple days earlier, he said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, recognize that her desolation is at hand. And he goes into detail about the siege of Jerusalem, which would happen 30 years later. He prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem. So he's trying to tell them, look, you need to redirect your thoughts here. To start understanding, you need to weep for yourself and for your children because what is coming is doom. This is his last pronunciation of doom. And whenever Jesus, Jesus warns, this is an act of grace, of saying, stop, reevaluate things, and see who I am. Back in Luke 13, he said, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you, but you would not. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And it's the whole thought of the vineyard parable, how Jesus ends that parable of saying, what is the owner of the vineyard going to do when he returns and finds that the people have killed his servants and have killed his son? That there will be a day of accountability. And there is a time coming when it will be said, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and breasts that never nursed. This is a strange beatitude, but it's, it's opposite of all Jewish hope. Because in their culture, to have children was the essence of life, right? For women. And, and we, we were introduced to Elizabeth at the beginning of Luke, where... She's told that she's going to have a child. And she's old in age, had always been barren. And she said, Lord, thank you for taking this disgrace away from me. So it was considered a disgrace not to have children, not to have posterity to pass down the, the family name. 
We all understand that. But here Jesus is saying, look, blessed are the women who don't have children because of the judgment that's coming and what you're going to witness. In other words, the Roman siege. And it's going to be so bad. I haven't gone into great detail about the actual Roman siege where there was around a million Jews slaughtered in Rome or in Jerusalem, Israel during that time when Israel finally fell in 66 to 70 AD. Um, it was a holocaust. I mean, if you want to read about it, it was terrible. And Jesus had predicted all of that. And it was so bad that people will cry out, mountains fall on us, cover us, that, you know, take my life because I don't want to witness what I'm going to see. And that's taken from Hosea chapter 10 and verse 8. So it's an Old Testament verse. I'm going to leave this back up. But we find these cycles of judgment on Israel over and over as they turn away from the Lord, become idolatrous, adulterous, apostate, and they don't seek the Lord. Instead, they seek other gods. I mean, this is the story of Israel. And, and God says, look, I'm going to bless you until you get to a point where you ignore me, then I'm coming in and I'm going to wake you up as a nation. And so, during the time of Hosea, to go back to the Old Testament time, you had the little tiny nation of Israel um, split in two after King David's reign as king and that wonderful time of Israel. Um, after him, after Solomon, the kingdom was broken in two. The northern kingdom, which is just termed in the Old Testament as Israel, the southern was called Judah. Okay, you're familiar with that. <clears throat> the northern kingdom never had a good king. Every king that they had was evil. And Hosea is prophesying against them, saying, the hammer's going to fall. Judgment is coming. And he uses this word. Um, so this is about 722 B.C., before Christ. David was around 900,000 B.C. So this is after David, after the nation has fallen in deep despair. <clears throat> God sends these people called the Assyrians to attack. He, it, they are their God's instrument of judgment on his people at that time because they are no longer acting like his people anymore. And so the Assyrians come in and it's a holocaust where they are killing men, women, children, slaughtering the children. And Jesus points back to this time and said, look, it, it would be better if you don't watch, have children, and watch them die. It's going to be such a bad time. And he said, this is going to happen in the future in Rome. Right there in Jerusalem, right here by the Romans. I don't like to talk about that kind of stuff. I really don't. I mean, I could go in depth with this, and it's it's horrendous. You do not want to fall in the hands of an angry God, who 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 is just, who who holds to His word and yet is loving in compassion. We're seeing this in Christ now. Christ is saying, look, we're at the end here. I'm ready to go to my death. You need to repent and seek the Lord. You need to understand who I am. I am the lamb being slaughtered for you. For you. 
out of God's love and compassion. Now these words are also used in Revelation chapter 6. I don't know if you're familiar, if you've read the book of Revelation, you come upon these very words. Because it's going to happen again in the end times. Before Christ comes, as the uh, trumpets, the seals, the bowls are poured out, at the sixth seal, as it's released in the world, a great earthquake, the, the sun goes black, the moon goes red, stars fall from the sky, everything's black, and the people will cry, fall on us, hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? It's like they don't, people are just going to want to die instead of try to survive of what's happening in the world before Christ comes. And that's the blackout in the world when the light of Christ comes for His return. So His words go beyond Jerusalem to the very end time when the nation itself will look on the one who they've pierced and repent and be saved as a nation. So his message is, weep for yourselves, you need to understand coming judgment. And he gives a proverb here in verse 31. For if the people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Okay, that, that, that makes sense. Look, if 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 this is all happening now, when, every, when life is here, when things are flourishing, Christ is speaking of Himself here, that when it's green, what will happen later on when it's dry? I just think of trying to light a tree on fire, a new tree with leaves and everything, and it takes a lot to get that to burn. But if you go to part of the forest where it's so dry, it doesn't take anything to light it up. And what Jesus is saying here is, look, if this is what the Romans do to me, what are they going to do to you? Israel. If they're doing this to me, what are they going to do to you? So here, there, there is no self-pity with Jesus at all. There is no woe is me as he's heading to the cross at all. He's saying, look, don't weep for me. Have pity on yourselves. This is not a tragedy. It is a victory. So we have this huge crowd that is just curious, amazed, disillusioned, disappointed, some people sympathizing with Jesus, feeling sorry for Him. That doesn't cut it. Sentimentality for Jesus does not cut it. I know a lot of people that have a good view of Jesus, but they don't see Him as Savior, as Lord. As the, as the God-man lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And it's a broad, broad world, but only the few will see. And Simon does, a thief on the cross, where Jesus says to the thief, today you'll be in paradise with me. Because the thief looked, on, looked at Jesus and said, you don't deserve this. I deserve what I'm getting, and I deserve much worse. I'm trusting as you. I believe you are who you said you are. And Jesus 
in a moment, said, today you'll be with me in paradise. What did the thief do? Nothing. What could the thief do? Nothing. He's on the cross on death's door. And he's saying, save me. Save me. There's no hope for me. And the whole message of Luke is Jesus has come to seek and to save. Right? They see him as Savior. And now we have that same message thrown to us. Do we see this whole end of Jesus' life as a tragedy? Oh, it's so terrible what happened to Jesus. Of course we feel that, of course. But we see past it. We see the divine perspective that this is the way it had to go. Because we would all be lost if Jesus didn't go to the cross. So we come to the cross with that right attitude of, Lord, I have nothing. I'm, I, I don't want to be a part of this world that looks at each other and says, Oh, you're good. You're not so good. I, I'm better than you. Maybe I'll be good enough to get into heaven. That leads to destruction. This path says, Lord, I have no hope. I have nothing before you. I don't deserve anything but death and judgment and hell. And it's impossible for man to be saved from that. But through you, all things are possible. And through Christ, he has made a way for each one of us. You can't get away from the gospel message anywhere you look at it. This is the life of Christ given to us and to be proclaimed to the world like Simon did. That we can know that we are saved, that we will be in heaven, in paradise with Christ. And we are part of the few. I love that. We few, we happy few who see Christ in his glory, his majesty. And I will serve him. I will take up my cross. I will die to myself and follow him. Follow his word. What a great message. We're not even to the cross yet. This is just weeping women. Oh, Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you that you've made access to heaven, to the kingdom, to you, to your righteousness, to eternal life. This is all brought to us by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, if there's any doubts in anyone's mind still today, Father, may we surrender to you and say, I am not capable of coming to you. I am not acceptable because I sin. I am a sinner before you. Jesus has said, if we believe in him and accept him as Lord, that we would be saved. What a great message to this world. What a great message for me and my family and my neighbors and all that I love. That God was coming into the world to save it. And that was Jesus. Father, may we be strong in proclaiming your word. May we tenderly Speak the truth to others that they may know Jesus. May we reveal to them who you are. And for us, give us wisdom, Father. Give us, give us gratitude even more. Expand our view of who you are. That in my quiet time, I will worship you. I will praise you and sing to you because I was a dead man and now I'm alive. 
all because of the resurrection of Christ and his death. Father, go with us this week with the power, power of the Holy Spirit to speak through us and to work through us to do good in this world for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.